sections 10.2 and 10.4 we're going to look at together. We're going to see, we're going to look at heat, how it's transferred, and how it's controlled. Okay, so we're going to define heat, we're going to relate heat transfer and thermal equilibrium, and we're going to discuss the modes of heat transfer that exist in their applications. So we'll start by defining heat, and heat is defined as the energy transferred between two objects because of a temperature difference. Okay, because of a temperature difference. So in this diagram, what's really happening here is that the heat that's transferring from one object to the other goes from the hot body to the cold body. And this is not due to work, but a temperature difference, really. Um, this is analogous to the object moving from a higher potential energy to a lower potential energy. So like the desire for us to always want to come down to a lower potential energy it is, a de is a difference in the gravitational energy there. That's what causes you to move. Well, the difference in the temperature is what causes heat to flow. And the direction of the energy transfer, can, ex can it can really be explained by thinking of the temperature as terms of average kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of the molecules in the water initially are moving very slowly, right? These are barely moving at all because they're down to 5 degrees Celsius. And the juice inside the can is moving rapidly, those kinetic energy molecules, because the temperature of the juice is 45 degrees Celsius. So heat is clearly coming out from the can, all right? That's the direction of energy transfer. Now. If these molecules are vibrating faster than these ones, over time what will happen is the energy from these molecules, some of it will be dissipated through the uh, can wall into the water molecules. So the water eventually warms up a little bit to 11 degrees Celsius and the can cools down to 11 degrees Celsius itself. So this in sense is thermal equilibrium. We'll take a look. The molecules now in this diagram you can see look like they're moving at the same speed. So they have the same kinetic energy or the same temperature. And what you'll notice here is that the direction of energy transfer is both out of the can and into the can and it's equal. So this is our state of equilibrium. This is our state of equilibrium. We can use something called calorimetry which is discussed in the next lesson to understand where this temperature of 11 degrees Celsius comes from. It depends on the material properties of the juice of the water itself called the specific heat capacity. But we'll see more about that mathematically in the next section. Let's take a look at some units of heat. The most basic unit that we know from physics is our joules, okay, and that's this SI unit of energy or heat. The unit that we're most commonly using in real life is the capital C calorie. And this capital C calorie is around 4,186 joules, okay, also known as a kilocalorie, okay, a kilocalorie. There's another type of unit that is used a lot in engineering and some sort of HVAC, the refrigeration, thermodynamics, and that's called a BTU, a British thermal unit. And that has a value of 1,055 joules. Now joules are a very, very small quantity, which is why we use these other units of energy in most applications. Lowercase c calories were really only used when you were talking about um, a unit of heat in old works in physics and chemistry like calorimetry and stuff. Small, small changes in the amount of energy. So this was a calorie around four joules. Now, heat and work go together because if you do work on an object, what you're doing is you're really changing its internal energy level. So for example, if you pull on a nail, right, out of a piece of wood, maybe a nail that you just hammered into with the back of a hammer, the friction between the nail and the wood that's going on when you're pulling it out of the wood increases the temperature of the nail itself. So as a result, how does that temperature increase? Because you're doing work and there's a heat transfer that's going on there. Another good example would be to think about like a, a paper clip or a rubber band. Take a paper clip and bend it back and forth enough, you'll feel heat on the paper clip, it'll eventually snap. Same thing with the rubber band. Keep stretching a rubber band out over and over again and then hold it stretched and feel the part that's stretched, you'll feel a little bit of heat there as well. Next, we'll take a look at the modes of heat transfer, and there are three of them. We're going to look at conduction, convection, and radiation. The first of the three is called conduction, and this involves the transfer of thermal energy between regions of matter or two different materials that are in contact, and it's due to a temperature gradient. So imagine one giant piece of metal where one end there's a heat source applied, right? There's imagine like a heat clamp or some sort of object clamped on you that's giving a lot of heat. Well, that heat will propagate throughout the molecules due to conduction. And what happens is there's a lot of vibrations here with the hot area. There's smaller vibrations here. Well, these vibrations will propagate themselves throughout this material, thus causing a heat flow because of the temperature gradient, the hot and cold. Now, conductive coefficients are called K. 
little k, like spring constant actually, and their material properties, and they describe the material's ability to transfer heat. Now in general, metals are good thermal conductors, while gases are traditionally poor thermal conductors. So thus, gases would be good insulators. And that's the reason why you see things like double pane windows, because you have the glass that could transfer heat so the room could lose heat, but then there's air in between the two panes of glass. That air acts as like a thermal barrier. The same thing goes for jackets in the winter, like parkas or down comforters. There's, they're puffy because there's air trapped in there that keeps the thermal conductivity of your body low, so you're able to keep the heat in. Another really good application is also computers. Your CPU gives off a lot of heat. So your CPU is this little processor, central processing unit, and on top of it there's usually placed the, what's called a heat sink. That heat sink absorbs most of the heat and it takes it away from the CPU and then either a fan runs over this, and we'll see what kind of transfer that is in a minute, or sometimes you use what's called a heat pipe. And I'll explain that in the next part as well. But the transfer of energy between the chip and the heat sink itself, that black rectangle on top, is due to conduction because they're two different materials in contact and that is due to a temperature difference. The second mode of heat transfer is convection. And convection is due to the movement of molecules within a fluid. And that results in some sort of heat transfer. Now this process really involves a combination of pressure differentials, buoyancy, and there's actually conduction as well. So what happens here is that the heat supplies the lower molecules of water with energy, giving them the opportunity to move faster and thus lowering their density because they're spreading out a little bit. So the lower density molecules start moving toward the top. And what happens is those hot molecules, as they move to the top, they displace the cold molecules that come to the bottom. And you get these things called convective currents. Convective. Now this is also how convection ovens work, the same idea, same principle. Um, we should also discuss the convective coefficients, and these are li listed as H. H is the convective coefficient. And again, it's a material property okay, that describes the ability of a fluid to transfer heat. And one thing to know is that convection is really, really, it's important that we look at surface area involved. Um, so let's take a look back at our computer example real quick. For the computer example, what we have a lot of the time is, again, that CPU and the heat sink on top of it. So conduction is moving some of the heat toward the heat sink. But then we run a fan over the surface. And the fan is a fluid flow flowing over the surface that absorbs some of the heat from the heat sink. And if that's not enough, you have something called a heat pipe, which is a pipe with a fluid in it that carries the heat away from the heat sink, and then the fan might be blown over the heat pipe itself. Another application of convection uh, to think about is to think about how you heat up your house. When you heat up your house and you look at the heating element, there's a lot of cross-sectional area exposed. It's not one giant pipe with water running through it. It's a pipe that continues to flow, so it looks like this, right? The hot water comes in, and then what it does is this. It's like a radiator in a sense. It kind of looks like a, a symbol for a light bulb or a resistor in, in uh, electrical. But what happens is there's a lot of surface area exposed on all of these surfaces. So the surface area increases. The amount of heat transfer due to convection also increases. In engineering, we traditionally call these fins. Okay, they're fins, and fins are like the back of an air conditioner, where it's like that sheet metal that comes off the back of the air conditioner. The reason for that is so there's a lot of area exposed. A way to draw fins, and it's tough to, I, mean, I have tough trouble with it. But think about like fins coming out of a source, like this. So maybe this is like a wall structure, okay, and these are the fins that come out of it, so the fins are literally protruding out of the wall. So there's a lot of cross-sectional area, so the heat can be dispersed or given off. And now the fluid flows in between these fins, allowing it to carry that current using convection again. Okay, the fluid will flow here, air might flow across the fins, and as a result, the heat moves outward. The final mode of heat transfer is radiation, and this is one that you're exposed to every single day. Uh, and it's a process in which energetic particles or waves travel through a medium or space. Okay, some space. Now, this process does not involve the transfer of matter here, and we know this because radiation can travel through a vacuum, okay? There is no transfer of matter here. Um, and what happens really is that objects reduce their internal energy level by emitting electromagnetic waves. So the sun is reducing its energy level, but the problem with the sun is that there's constantly fusion reactions going on, so it has a constant source of energy, but it wants to release energy or become 
a state of equilibrium with its surrounding environment. And the same thing goes with humans. Humans give off radiation because their body temperature is higher than the ambient temperature. And you, would and you can see this effect using thermal goggles. Reason being is that the wavelength that humans emit are from the infrared portion of the spectrum.